Okay, I think we are ready to go. Does the volume and everything sound appropriate for you guys? Can you hear me? I hadn't had the sound on. I didn't have the sound on. Alright, we got four or five people here, it looks like now, so that's good. Um, sorry about that, I don't know what was going on, I just restarted and it seemed to be working fine now, or more or less. So, uh, let's kind of get rolling here. So, your test tomorrow is, I think I've decided, it's going to be pretty much completely matching. Um, so, I, there might be a couple multiple choice questions in there if I decide after I get done making it after this. Uh, but for the most part, I think it's going to be more or less just matching from the main vocabulary and things. Okay? Uh, so, it doesn't mean we shouldn't review everything here, though, as much as we can. Uh, so, let's kind of r start running through this now and try to be as efficient as we can, right? So, we're going to rip through those, but... Okay, so we start off the unit here talking about our westward expansion, right? And this GIF right here is going to keep running uh, continuously on a loop here, but you can see kind of how the United States began to... The expansion, you can see how the states kind of came into play uh, and how we began to expand there, right? So, a lot of the expansion is going to come after the Civil War, right? It's going to be really in that area, right where my mouse is. I, can, I think I can go... Like, you see that little pointer there? So between the Mississippi River right here, kind of going up this way, right? And the Pacific Ocean over here. Uh, so that's that's a pretty big deal, right? That all those things that's going to fuel this migration is... You got the railroad, right? When the railroad gets, gets completed, going across the country, right around there. Uh, that that's a big deal, right? And it's going to allow people to move into the main heart of the country, the heartland, if you will. Uh, you're going to have mining, and mining. Right, the gold's going to be discovered in California, kind of up here near where it's modern day San Francisco. Then uh, you're going to have gold also discovered in, in uh, Colorado and up in the Black Hills and the Dakotas. You're going to have silver and things like that, and you know all in Nevada and Utah, uh, where these mining towns are going to pop up. So you also have the cow towns, right? And we're going to get into that in a second, so I'm not going to speak about them too much right now. But then the ranching that comes from the cow towns and the cattle herding. But mostly, it's just cheap or free land that is driving these people westward, right? So this is another cool animated GIF right here. It's going to show you the population density as the decades go by. You can really see you know, when people are moving westward and where exactly they are going to be. So let's kind of let this finish loading here for another couple seconds until we get to 2010 and then we're going to keep going okay so if you it's pretty neat uh, really cool to see that that population density for sure okay so we were talking about the cowboy right and the cowboy they're going to bring the cattle they're going to herd the cattle up from texas these texas longhorns if you will up from texas to the railroad lines right uh, it's going to be a job for a number of people after the civil war a lot of african americans are going to end up being cowboys actually because it's kind of an equal opportunity thing uh, that it's driven by your skill right if you're good on the trail then well they don't really care what color your skin is uh, but these these trails you know go hundreds if not thousands of miles up from Texas uh, to these railroad lines where they then bring the cattle uh, they get they they load the cattle into cattle cars right and then they ship them off east or they ship them off west right uh, and that's giving it to the markets, you know, in the east and the west in major cities, essentially, and the cattle is worth almost ten times as much uh, between Texas and where they could sell them on the train lines in the cow towns, right? So you have this cheap land. We also talked about you have the Homestead Act, which I can pretty much say should you should definitely know about and think about as far as a thing that you might want to know. Uh, the Homestead Act is going to give free public land uh, to people in the west, right? Uh they were slaughtered uh, at the t at the cities uh, for meat, Maya. Um, so anyway, the Homestead Act, right? You're going to get free pe free land for people, uh, and, it, and it's people take advantage of it, right? People are looking to rebuild their lives after the Civil War, and that's going to really play into that, right? Uh, so they hey, there's free land over there, or even cheap land, and people are going to take advantage of it, and they're going to go. Uh, okay, so and this is a lot of African Americans are going to take advantage of this too, because, well, they want to get out of the south, right? The conditions in the south that we've been talking about for weeks now. Um, so life on the plains, we... 
it, we know it's harsh, right? It's really tough. You, you know, in the beginning, you know, there, you're, there's not much wood or anything. There's no trees to build things with, so they're building houses out of dirt and sod, right, and grass essentially. So you have these sod houses uh, for a long period of time until they start to get more lumber and building materials in from other areas of the country, right? You have the extreme weather conditions, right? You have these major thunderstorms during the summer uh, and during tornado seasons, of course. Uh, you also have hot, you know, in the summer and extremely cold in the winter. Uh, we talked about the locusts, remember those guys, uh, you know, eating tons and tons of crops, you know, when they had these big swarms that happened, big plagues of locusts, to be fair. Uh, and then you also have uh, the dryness of it, right? We talked about the different drynesses and the water and the ground, you have the aquifers, um, and the different, you know, over the mountain, you know, the short grass versus mixed grass and tall grass, it's just basically as you get farther away from the mountains, you have more moisture, uh, and therefore the grasses can grow taller, and it's also better farming land, but as you were over here, it's a little more deserty, uh, which is why they rely on the aquifers and the water in the ground, which is how they pump up that water with windmills, right? Um, so, anyway, this is just another map of the there. Okay, so we have the new technologies, and new technologies are going to really also play a role in this, right? So you have the railroad bringing people in, you have the mechanical reaper down here, which is going to help cut crops and be more efficient in harvesting of crops, and these things, and other technologies too, are going to help open the land up for settlement, you know, going west. It's going to help make farming more profitable by increasing the efficiency of the production and linking those resources and markets together, right? Uh, markets, you know, in the east and the west, and linking the res yeah, linking what they've just harvested to those places, right? The railroad is super important for that, and that's why you're going to actually get multiple railroads. Uh, okay, so by the turn of the 19, of 1900 or so, the Great Plains is no longer going to be this just empty place, right? You're going to have people, and we saw the population density, they're heading into there, right? It's going to be a region of farms and ranches and towns and things like that. We, we extensively talked about the Native American policy. That stuff's not going to necessarily be on the test uh, for sure, but I wanted to go into that in quite a bit more detail for, um, than what the standards actually say because I think it's, it's necessary. But uh, anyway, right, what you do need to know is that the, there's forcible removal of the American Indians from their lands, uh, and it's going to continue all the way through the 19th century as settlers continue to move west after the Civil War, right? The Indian Wars you can associate with going on almost till about 1924, uh, all the way after World War I, uh, when, when kind of the last of the Apaches and things like that down here in Arizona uh, and New Mexico are, are going to kind of give in and so, uh, anyway, elsewhere, right, we have other major inventions, right, and other inventions are going to be playing into... So, my, it wasn't exactly one war, right? It's just wars that with and battles and skirmishes with different Native American groups throughout that course and throughout that many years. It's not one war, right? And they're all different Native American groups. Um, that It's not one big fight. Um, so, anyway, okay? So, the technological advantages, te sorry, technological advances are going to spur growth in cities, right? And the big ones, so the inventions, you have this corporation and this idea of limited liability of corporations. Um, that's, that's a big thing. It's going to help corporations grow, uh, for sure. So you have the Bessemer steel process, the light bulb, electricity, uh, you know, the telephone, the airplane, and the assembly line. So let's look at all of those individually here. So the Bessemer steel process is the situation where you're going to have significantly more efficient creation of steel. Steel, right? Before this process was brought to America, and really before it was, it was figured out, in general, steel was extremely expensive and not efficient to make right? Uh, because of how long it took, it was expensive, right? So having a lot of it was really tough. Uh, so these big structures that we see in cities now without steel, you know, it wouldn't be possible because steel is extremely strong for its weight. And uh, this process is a big deal. Uh, it's going to revolutionize the way cities are created and it's going to allow for large bridges and big tall buildings and things like that, right? Uh, so you have the light bulb also. The light bulb is going to be invented by Thomas Edison in Menlo Park, New Jersey. Uh, the incandescent light bulb, right? And it, it's going to now pave the way for the push for use of electricity as source of power and light and things like that, right? So you have the telephone also being created by Alexander Graham Bell. 
He's going to be awarded the first patent in 1876. You can see some of the first drawings here of the circuits being created. And this is a, I believe this is a picture, it's a ceremonial picture of Alexander Graham Bell on the telephone uh, linking his lab and Chicago, so a couple hundred miles away, uh, which is a pretty big deal. But um, So anyway, to the airplane. So this is the first powered flight by the Wright brothers, or Orville and Wilbur. Uh, and this is in 1903 in December. And this is a picture of that at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, right? So you have the assembly line. Henry Ford's assembly line is going to revolutionize production in the factories. It's going to make things extremely more efficient and effective as far as creation goes, right? So you have the picture right here. The idea is that everyone has their own piece of the puzzle that they do, uh, and when you pass it all on the line, it's going to be more efficient, and also you don't need to have any major skills, right? You can have anyone do this. If it all it takes is to screw in this one little piece, uh, anyone should be able to do that, and then you just pass it on the line to the next person with a little bit of a different job, and, and you can have enough people along the line, you can fully assemble the thing you're trying to create, right? So, let's get into the people, right? Cornelius Vanderbilt, he is, you know, if you remember, we've been watching The Men Who Built America a little bit when we have returns. He is the railroad guy, right? But his wealth is going to come mostly from shipping, actual boats early on. He's going to then take that money and then reinvest it into the railroads after the Civil War. Uh, it's going to become a major... It, it's it's... It's, he becomes extremely rich, right? Extremely wealthy. He's going to control many of the major rail lines in the Northeast, in particular the ones going into New York City, right? And as a result, he makes a boatload of money. Uh, next, you get John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller is going to be, you know, he makes his fortune in the oil business. He creates the company called Standard Oil. The idea is the standardization of this oil, right? Uh, and effectively, that standardization, you know, it, the whole product would be the similar quality, right? Um, but anyway, Rockefeller is this big oil businessman. He strikes a deal with Vanderbilt to ship his oil around the country, and that's how he gets it out there. Uh, and then eventually he gets so wealthy uh, that he's able to do other things with that money, uh, and so on. So then you have Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie is the steel industry. He brings Bessemer's process to America, essentially. He creates the Carnegie Steel Empire. It's going to grow into this multi-million dollar empire, and they're eventually going to be bought by a man named J.P. Morgan. So, who is he? J.P. Morgan is a finite financier. Uh, he bought bankrupt railroads, and he typically combines and reorganizes those things into single entities, um, trying to make them more efficient and better. Right. Um, so, he also gets involved with General Electric, but for the most part, he is a investment banker, right? Um, so, so what are some of the reasons for this economic transformation and the changes, right? Uh, for starters, at the end of the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution, you're going to have very, uh, what's called a laissez-faire capitalism, right? And what that essentially means is that you're going to let it be. The government's going to more or less have very little regulation on these businesses, and that's going to allow almost unlimited growth for these people, you know, based off of their their uh, resolve and their work ethic and things like that, uh, as long as they can outcompete the market. Uh, and that's a pretty big deal, um, and that's one of the reasons why they get so wealthy and so rich, but then it's also why they're going to then need to rein them in a little bit when they get so powerful later on with, with the antitrust movements, uh, which we'll talk about later in this video. So, anyway, uh, you're going to also have a lot of immigration, right, and migration also from other areas of the country to these cities, uh, and therefore you're going to have a major increase in the supply of the people that are working, right, the supply of labor. And then lastly, America's natural resources, right, are it are vast, especially at this point, right? So you have this natural wealth in the country and navigable, ri navigable rivers and now the railroad, right? And all of these things are going to help push and transform this, this country once we get the Industrial Revolution rolling, really so, after the Civil War, right? So immigration, right? Where is immigration coming from? For the most part, early immigration, right, prior to about 1871, really up uh, just about till after the Civil War, uh, you're going to have it from Northern and Western Europe, right? You have Germany, Great Britain, Ireland, Norway, Sweden. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have the second half of immigration, right? The late immigration here. Uh, that's going to be more Eastern and Southern Europe as well as even Asia, right? Coming in uh, on both sides of the country. You're going to have Ellis Island in the East and Angel Island in the West uh, in San Francisco and New York, right? 
So, uh, these people typically are looking for freedom and to better their lives for their families, to escape religious persecutions, all sorts of different reasons, right? We talked about push factors and pull factors, if you remember, right? So, anyway, immigrants made valuable contradiction contributions. We're not going to be doing a Kahoot, Grayson, um, just because it doesn't really work over the internet. We've tried it a couple times now, right? And it wasn't really super successful. We'll play something as a review tomorrow in class for sure. Probably the baseball game you guys liked a little bit. Um, but anyway, so immigrants made valuable contributions to the dramatic industrial growth of America during this time period, right? Uh, so we know that Chinese workers, they helped build the transcont transcontinental railroad. Uh, the immigrants that came into New York City were working in textile mills and steel plants and things like that, right, in the Northeast um, and clothing industry in New York City. Uh, you're going to have the Slavs, the Italians, and the Poles. They are going to get into the more middle of the country and work in the coal mines, especially in places like Pennsylvania. Um, so these immigrants... Uh, if you don't have your headset on, then... Uh, yes, okay. Um, we will be playing Kahoot, or we will not be... So, um, they often worked for low pay, uh, these immigrants, right, and have suffered dangerous uh, conditions, working conditions, right, to help build the nation's industrial strength, right? So, during this time, right, they came through uh, Ellis Island in New York, the New York Harbor, and in the West, they came through Angel Island, right? Um, so, anyway, you got one of the early pictures of the Statue of Liberty right here. I believe this picture is like 1900, although I think it must be colorized. Uh, and then this is Ellis Island here as well around that time period. So we get this whole idea of the melting pot, right? Immigrants began the process of assimilating into what was then going to be termed the melting pot. And then often, you know, you have these neighborhoods that develop, right, in growing cities. Uh, people coming from a particular area, they are going to want to live with like people, right? They can speak the language and have similar customs and things like that while they all work hard to learn English and other things, right? Uh, you're going to get public schools, uh, especially once we start to get compulsory education, uh, where that's going to become a major assimilating point to bring people together. Oh, uh, I, it's right here. It's a link to it. Can I pop it up? by the German, Dutch, and French. The principle still sticks, our heritage is mixed. So, so any kid, kid could be the president. president. You simply melt right It doesn't matter what your skin. It doesn't matter where you're from or your religion. You jump right.
Indians, liberty and immigrants. They brought the country's customs, their language and their ways. They filled the factories too. Another minute, guys. All right, now that that is over, um, let's go continue on, right? So, uh, we, we also know that there is a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. Am I too loud, guys? Am I, is my mic breaking up on you guys, or is it the volume perfect? What do you guys think? Let me know in the chat. Um, but anyway, right, so even though we know immigrants are, are valuable, you know, they're leading to valuable contributions, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get some hostility as well from people that are worried about these it's a little too loud let me see if I can fix that maybe this is better mic check mic check that's probably a bit better um, okay so anyway uh, there is a bunch of fear over these immigrants right and there, there's fear that these immigrants are going to take these jobs uh, for lower pay than the American workers that were already there um, and you're going to get prejudice based off of religious and cultural differences as well right you have uh, anti-immigrant cartoons here right the German and the Irish uh, are going to steal away the ballot box as other people are fighting in the background right after the results um, so you have people getting worried and anxious about the immigrants right you have the other anti-immigrant cartoons uh, if you go into the actual uh, PowerPoint online there is a whole thing right here uh, that you can link you it's a link you can click and there's a whole bunch more right so the proposed immigrant immigrant dumping site right this Ellis Island uh, where they would come in and dump is basically what they're talking about right um, Statue of Liberty right uh, the the problems oops the problem solved the great fear of the period Uncle Sam may be swallowed by foreigners right so you have this anti-immigrant settlement that we're talking about right so that resentment uh, is gonna lead Congress to pass some limitations on immigration right and these are two things that you could very easily show up the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Immigrant Restriction Act of 1921 uh, so this is going to stop Chinese from coming in to the country right completely and this is going to basically restrict and place quotas on the immigrants that are coming into the country uh, so only certain amount of, of each country and people can come in um, so that's a big deal, right? And however, the immigrants of this period and continue to contribute to society uh, and so on, right? Uh, you have this other cartoon right here, right? So uh, all these people are welcome, right? These communists and socialists and hoodlums, but sorry, no Chinamen. Um, anyway, so we have these growth of these cities going on as a result of all the things we've been talking about, right? Uh, so much so that between these 30 years, 1890 to 1920, you know, LA is going to grow by almost 10 times and New York is going to grow by three times. Uh, you have the crowding in the cities and in the streets, right? Um, this is Mulberry Street in New York City around the turn of the 1900s. Uh, so, anyway, these big cities are going to become manufacturing and transportation centers, right? Uh, and you're going to have factories in these large cities is going to provide jobs and workers' families are going to live in these harsh conditions, the crowded tenements and slums that we talked about, right? The whole uh, how the other half lives, Jacob Reese, we saw that in the video we watched. So, um, as this growth of these cities 
spans rapidly, right, you are going to get some issues that need to be taken care of, right, and you're going to get new public services. So dealing with all that human waste, you're going to get sewage systems, right, getting running water into these places is going to make a big difference uh, into the slums and tenements, uh, but elsewhere as well. Public transportation, you're going to get subways being built, and you can see construction of subways here, and imagine you're having to reroute all of the infrastructure that was already in place um, to build these subways. You know, it's a whole and tremendous effort to get done for sure, which is also why some cities are going to opt for above ground transportation, right? Like trolleys and things like that and streetcars. Um, so anyway, we then get to the Gilded Age, right? So the Gilded Age, the concept of this, we just did this recently, so I'm going to try to really blow through this. Um, you're going to have this whole idea of Gilded, right? So Gilded means covered thinly with gold leaf or gold paint, right? And it, it these ex excesses of the elites and the wealthy are going to thinly veil society to make it seem like things are a little bit better than they actually are, right? These lavish lifestyles of these rich robber barons that we've basically were talking about before, the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and things like that, right? It's going to kind of cover up the major income disparities and the rough life that these people are living, these unskilled laborers and things like that, right? It's also going to help you know, cover up the control of the government by the money interests, right? Uh, and we're going to see this cartoon in a second, but there's, there's tons of horrible work conditions in this time period, right? The dangerous work conditions we talked about. We did the whole assignment on child labor that you guys saw. You're going to have long hours and low wages, no job security, no benefits, company towns, right? The things, um, all things we've talked about, no or underemployment of women, right? This is skyscrapers building with no safety harnesses, crowded, tough conditions in the factories. I'm sure it gets hot in there with machinery going and everyone involved, kids work in the factories. Um, we know we did, we did a whole thing on this, right? We all had to write a little bit for me. Um, as a warm-up for about this, like what this meant, right? And you have the big money interests here, you know, overlooking the Senate and being able to enter, you know, for the monopolists here. And this is a Senate for the monopoly of the monopolists by the monopolists for the monopolists, right? And the people's entrance over here, uh, it's closed, right? People can't come in, but these people can basically buy the senators and get laws passed on their behalf, right? So. With these tough things and horrible things, you're going to get the progressive era, right? The progressive era, you're going to get people that are looking to institute reforms for the problems we've been talking about that have been created by the industrialization. You're going to get Teddy Roosevelt's square deal, right? You're going to get, uh, I need to change that. You're going to get Woodrow Wilson's new freedom and Teddy Roosevelt's square deal is all about three C's. It's conservation control of corporations, and then protection for the consumer, okay, uh, which are all big things considering what we've been talking about, right? Uh, that's, that's pretty huge. So you're also going to get uh, the big progressive goals, right, is this bringing the control of the government back to the people. Uh, as opposed to the big money interests, right, uh, and also guaranteeing the economic opportunities through government regulation for people, right? You're going to start to get things like minimum wages and things like that. Um, you're going to also get rid of some social injustices um, working toward that. Like women are going to be able to vote. Uh, you get the muckrakers, right? And the big muckrakers, all these people you should definitely know going into tomorrow uh, and who what they are associated with, right? They are reform-minded journalists who are looking to attack the institutions uh, and leaders of the country and politicians as corrupt, right, when necessary, right? They're going to rake the muck, clean up the dirt, right? And you get Jacob Reese and his exposure of the tenements, right? The how the other half lives. You get Ida Tarbell, who attacks Standard Oil and, and Rockefeller and their monopolistic practices. You're going to have Joseph Kepler, who's the political cartoonist that did this one right here, uh, but also a number of other ones that are going to kind of just that bring shed light to a lot of the country. Then you're going to have Upton Sinclair, who writes The Jungle, uh, regarding the conditions in the meatpacking industry and the horrible factory conditions that these people had to deal with on a regular basis. And you can see Teddy Roosevelt here. Um, raking the muck of the meat, meat packing industry and the scandal down here, and he's eventually going to help pass what's called the Food and the Clean Food and Drug Act, which is going to be big, to stand, have quality standards for food and, and drugs. Pretty amazing, necessary stuff. 
So you're also going to get, and we're almost done here, you're also going to get labor unions, right? And labor unions are going to be coming together. They are organized labor, right? Labor union is an organized association of workers often in a trade or a profession formed to protect and further the rights and interests of people, right? Of the people working for them, right? So it's going to start off as the Knights of Labor. Uh, it's going to be kind of more of a skilled union, but eventually as you get along, get on later, uh, you're going to get more and more people interested in joining unions and the membership is swelling drastically and incredibly. You know, some of the into the millions, and you're going to have the American Federation of Labor, led by a man named Samuel Gompers. Uh, you're going to have the American Railway Union, and among others, right? But you're also going to have the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. These are all, you know, important things you should know going into tomorrow for sure. Okay, uh, and these unions are going to give leverage back to the workers, right? They're going to be able to, if they can strike and not work, uh, the people that own the factories and things, they're going to want to keep that work going, so they're going to maybe pay them a little bit more in order to get the job, right? Uh, get it, keep it going. Uh, we saw a number of this, you know, there are pictures of this. We talked about the major strikes. You have the Haymarket Square riot in Chicago, where you have people, Police and people being killed by the anarchist bomb outside of uh, the, har the McCormick Harvester Company. You're going to have the Homestead Strike, which is a major strike by steel workers in Pittsburgh, uh, being squashed by paid security forces and eventually the Pennsylvania National um, Militia. Uh, and you have the Pullman Strike as well, which is led by Eugene Debs uh, and the American Railway. Uh, and it's going to be in response to wage reduction that they weren't ready for, that they are, they're going to burn a number of railway cars and things like that. Okay, uh, and things, and this is getting down to the very end here, right? You have gains that are going to be fought, right, for the progressives and the unions, right? The, we're going to get child labor laws. We're going to get limited working hours. You're going to get regulated working conditions in general, right? Uh, you're going to get the sh antitrust laws, the Sherman Antitrust Act, which is going to prevent businesses that structure, um, you know, like monopolies. Uh, it's going to prevent this, right? You're going to get also further legislation called the Clayton Antitrust Act, which is going to expand uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act, outlaws price fixing, exempts unions from the Sherman Act, and, and stuff like that. <sighs> Sorry, one second. <sighs> okay, um, you're going to get some changes as well uh, in elections. Okay, let me. Sorry, I just want to look. Okay, so in the elections, right? So you have a number of different things you need to look at, and I would definitely know these things with the bold and underlines. Um, but you're going to get local governments. You're going to get commissioner style and city manager styles, where you're going to get boards of commissioners, right? Board uh, boards and city boards that are going to be able to choose and decide. Um, it's going to make things a little bit more responsive for the forming of government and trying to make it a little less corrupt uh, in comparison to what some of the people that we experienced in the late 1800s. So in state governments, you're going to get these three things called referendums, initiatives, recalls. So a referendum is a general vote by the electorate on a single political question that has been referred to them for direct decision. Okay? Uh, so that, that's people will decide this, and they're going to give it to the, the people, right? They're going to get to choose. They're going to get to vote. Whereas initiative, right, people come up with this idea, and enough people want this to get passed, uh, it, it can also be passed. Uh, without going through the legislature. Uh, then you're going to get recall, right? A recall is a potential way to remove an elected official from office through voting uh, before a term is ended, which is a pretty big deal. You're going to get primary elections are the method that the general public is going to be able to use to decide who, who their preference is for general election. Uh, you're going to get the direct election of U.S. Senators as the 17th Amendment uh, of the Constitution. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's barking at someone outside. Um, but anyway, so you have this direct election of U.S. Senators instead of being elected through the legislature, uh, which is a pretty big deal, right? And the whole idea is returning the government back to the people. Uh, and then you're going to get secret ballots, right? If you don't have to tell anyone who you voted for, uh, that's a big deal. You can actually vote your conscience and vote how you see fit and not have to worry. Right, so we talked about women's suffrage. Uh, your leader is Susan B. Anthony, and women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, the women's suffrage movement is going to help encourage women to enter the labor force during World War One. 
and then you're you're going to get the 19th amendment to the constitution which is going to guarantee the women the right to vote okay uh, we talked about and this is a multiple times sorry uh, multiple thing times so you need the jim crow laws and other restrictions right the lawful segregation in the south laws requiring african americans and whites to be separated in public settings right you're going to lead to the voting restrictions that are going to be passed in the south the poll taxes the literacy tax the grandfather clauses and things we've all we've talked about a number of times you're going to get the intimidation and crime the lynchings, which we talked about, right, uh, and just the intimidation by people like the KKK and those groups, um, those pe people in the South, right. Uh, you're going to then get a landmark Supreme Court case called Plessy versus Ferguson, which is going to justify and basically rule that this separate but equal environment is okay, right? So with this separation now being okay, uh, African as long as America, African Americans are going to have access to public facilities or accommodations equal to that of those of whites, and we know equal is a very loose term here, right? Equal, um, among other things, right? So, great. Okay, so this separate but equal environment is going to pave the way, really, for the 50 plus more years of issues um, leading all the way into the civil rights movement, right? And as a response, these African Americans are going to want to get out of the South, right? Between all the intimidation, excuse me, and all the other stuff uh, that we've been talking about, right? They're going to want to leave the South and get out of there. You're going to get what's called the Great Migration. They're going to head up to northern, more northern cities, um, we should say. I'm trying to, to find jobs and escape the poverty and discrimination in the South, right? Uh, as a result of African Americans, you know, not having some of these rights, you're going to get some prominent figures emerge to tackle these injustices, right? You're going to get Ida B. Wells, who's going to lead an anti-lynching crusade and call on the federal government to take action against the injustices of that. Uh, you're going to have W.E.B. Du Bois, who is going to ultimately believe that the rights is the most important thing, and until we have equality, that is hard to be able to uh, get the equality that you want, right? So, it's, sorry, it's hard to get what you want without the equality, right? So, you need laws and things like that and protections for these people first. Uh, and therefore, he's going to pass, he's going to create what's called the NAACP uh, or help create, and it's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, and then lastly, you're going to have Booker T. Washington. He is going to be the opposite side of the coin a little bit. He's going to believe that through vocational education and economic success, uh, that's the way that you ultimately get the equality that you were looking for by proving your smarts and proving your worth. Essentially, that's how you get the equality. Uh, and as a result, he's going to create what's called the Tuskegee Institute, which is going to become an all-black education facility. Uh, yeah, and there's a picture of it down there on the bottom. Uh, so he's also going to kind of accept a bit of a social separation as a result. Um, anyway, okay, so that's really a quick run through of all of it. I hope that helps you guys quite a bit. You can obviously watch this as many times as you feel like you need um, and such. So I hope this helped you study. Any last questions, please get them out now. And if not, I'm going to be shutting off the stream in a minute or two. So thanks, guys, for coming out. We had six of you, at least, I think, at the most, so that's pretty good. All right, if I don't hear anything from you guys, then I am going to assume that that's it. So thanks, guys, and have a good rest of your night. Good luck studying for this test. Do not forget that you can have yourself a card, right? I'm letting you bring one card into the exam, so get as much of it as you possibly can uh, onto that index card. All right, guys, have a great rest of your night.